Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Simon Patton from EMQN. Um, I'm one of your co-chairs for today's uh, webinar. So this is a non-promotional master's class organized and funded by AstraZeneca. And we're gonna be talking about ensuring accurate classification of HRR variants. Next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping rules, please. Um, we've, we've got already got 150 or so participants dialed in. So the, the key rule, if you like, first of all, is please ensure that your microphone is muted. We, we will automatically mute them, but please don't uh, unmute it until we, we give the opportunity to be able to do any feedback if necessary at the end of it. Um, the webinar itself is being recorded and that's primarily so that you are able to then access it after the uh, after this session has closed. Um, it'll probably take us um, 10, to 10, 10 days to two weeks to get through compliance, but we hope to be able to make it available to you uh, and as a good resource and a learning resource for you to be able to uh, help your, your training with respect to HRRV gene variant classification. Um, and most importantly, we really value your feedback. Um, so you can submit your question and answers through the Q&A window, which you can find on the bottom menu bar of the Zoom app. Um, we're not going to do a live uh, Q&A feedback session at the end of the webinar. But what we are going to do is uh, collect all your responses or your questions and then add those to the scheme report that we're going to feed back at the end of it. Um, so we collate all the data. Uh, and the next webinar, which uh, follows on from the end of the, of the uh, run itself, will actually have uh, much more of an interactive feedback session with a proper live Q&A session. Um, but we think there's more value today in making sure that the uh, really fantastic presentation that's going to be given by our speakers, um, the educational component has really got through to you guys. So the, the value for that is will be collecting the data from the end of it and feeding back to you uh, in the report itself. So please do submit your uh, questions via the Q&A window at the bottom. Next slide, please. OK, uh, and also we feedback is really important for us. Um, it certainly helps us to improve. Uh, and, and providing these webinars is part of our commitment, if you like, to providing high quality training to all health care professionals undertaking this type of activity. So after the masterclass is finished, um, you will receive a short, um, an email, should I say, with a link to a short feedback survey. It should only take um, two minutes or so to complete, but we do encourage you, please, to make sure you feedback after, this, after the webinar so that we can also learn from the experience. OK, next slide, please. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to just obviously do the introduction here to say that we have um, a fantastic group of speakers for you today. Um, experts in this field have done, have got stacks and stacks of experience in, in variant classification. Um, so my, our, we have speakers from Ghent, so Kathleen Klaas, uh, uh, from Alberta in Canada, Andrew Morani, and last but not least, um, from Dublin in Ireland, Trudy McDevitt, and myself and my co-chair, uh, Prof Sandy Deans from GenQA, are chairing this meeting, this, this webinar for you. So I think that's uh, one last slide to do. So thank you very much. So that obviously our disclaimers and disclosures and I'll hand over to my co-chair Sandy Deans. Thank you, Simon. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, so just to add my welcome to Simon's um, and thank you for joining the webinar. There's been a question in the chat um, already just to clarify. So yes, you will be able to access this recording after um, today. And as Simon says, it may take up to two weeks to go through compliance, but we will definitely send the link out as soon as we're able to do so. So I will just give a, a very quick outline of the aims of the webinar today, and then the second subsequent follow-up webinar, which will take place on the 8th of December. So it's about providing these educational webinars to promote ac accurate classification of HRR gene variants. Now we've run um, previous masterclasses and uh, similar webinars, predominantly focusing on BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene variants, but we're now extending that um, on the back of a successful run last year, um, and we're looking at different um, HRR genes as well as BRCA1, BRCA2. 
So today we have our expert panel that Simon has introduced and we're going to start talking about best practice guidance, what's available for us and what other resources can be used. Um, and then which is always incredibly useful is actually to see the guidance and the documentation being used in action. And our panel is going to go through um, six different variants um, and work through the examples and what evidence is being used and why that classification has come about. Now to sort of evidence your education and demonstrate the competency in this area, there is now a GTAC online training and competency tool, which will be open after today. We currently have um, 357 participants registered. So I'd encourage you, if you're on the red webinar today and would like to participate, then please do do so. And we'll give you um, details of how to do that shortly. Participation is open to everyone as it's funded through an AstraZeneca and Merck um, educational grant and it really is a benefit for you yourself. It's not a laboratory based exercise, it's about you so you can use it for participation and demonstrating of your continual professional development or your continuing medical education. You will be asked to classify six HR gene variants and summarize the criteria used. And this information then will be generated and collated so you get your own feedback score report back to yourself that can be downloaded from the website. And also we'll collate an overarching EQA summary report whereby you can see the results from all participants plus the expert panel review. We will present this um, on the second webinar in December and give you a summary of the EQA outcomes. So when you log into your um, assessment online, you'll be able to download your submission. So when it comes to the second webinar, you will have on to hand what you actually submitted yourself. And then we will have a live Q&A session um, during that webinar. And just to say any questions that are submitted today through the Q&A um, and also in December, we will have a written response to those in the EQA summary report as well. Next slide, please. So the objectives really for these webinars and the EQA exercise is to really give an overview of the framework to classify variants um, and HR our genes and BRCA sometimes are classified in different ways than other gene engineering variants. And it's important that we have these focused webinars to be able to um, specifically drill down to the evidence and the, the guidelines that are available to us. Also, we want to outline the mechanism of classifying somatic variants according to guidelines. Um, and as I said, we highlight the specific resources to these genes that we're looking at today. And as I just previously mentioned, it's always incredibly useful to see worked examples rather than just educational um, and a, a lecture facility, but actually to see them in action in the real world. Next slide, please. So um, I've got great pleasure now to hand over to Kathleen, who is going to give you a, a summary and a, an educational elements of the best practice guidelines for us. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Sandy and Simon. Uh, I will first give uh, an introduction about uh, the BRCA genes and HRR gene classif variant classification and the best practice guidelines that are available. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So to start with, I would like to present you here the HRR gene uh, pathway. As you know, DNA double strand breaks are amongst the most uh, threatening uh, variations that can occur in, in, in genome and they will really affect the genome integrity. So they need to be repaired. To do this, uh, the cells have different pathways available. Uh, so we have the classical, classical non-homologous end uh, joining pathway, the single strand annealing pathway, and the homologous recombination uh, pathway. However, um, the choice is a bit dependent on the cell cycle. So you see here that the classical non-homologous end joining pathway is mainly uh, active during GN phase of the cell cycle. Um, but it can be can also act uh, throughout um, uh, other um, moments of the cell cycle, but most prominently during the G1 phase of the cell cycle. It starts with uh, phosphorylation of uh, P of uh, 53 BP1, and then um, it's uh, important the non-homologous end joining. It will directly seal broken uh, ends, 
but the repair product is often accompanied by sequence uh, alteration, so it's inaccurate. Same uh, counts for the single strand annealing uh, pathway, which is uh, most uh, which occurs during M phase of the um, cell cycle when the uh, end joining pathway and HRR part pathway are not active. However, also here, um, this pathway uses homologous um, repeats to bridge uh, DNA to bridge DNA double strand breaks. And also this leads to uh, large uh, rearrangements, including deletions and translocations. So it's also a very inaccurate uh, pathway. Today's focus is, however, on this pathway, the HRR pathway, where it starts with an activation of, uh, uh, of BRCA1 um, that will um, result in um, PAL B2, PRC2 mediated double strand entry section. Uh, to single strand uh, DNA and then the replication protein A and the RAT51 will uh, anneal and uh, DNA double strand breaks are repaired using the homologous region of the sister chromatids as a repair uh, template, as a replicative template. So uh, this can only occur during late S and G2 phase of the cell cycle because these um, uh, the, the, these uh, sister chromatid needs to be available. And this pathway is important, not only because many of these genes are associated with an increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer, but also, of course, they can be targets of uh, therapeutic uh, interventions. What kind of variants ca can we find now in BRC1, 2, and the other HRR gene, um, uh, genes? So you can have missing variants when there is a, a substitution of one nucleotide that results in um, a change uh, to another amino acid. Uh, frame shift variants, uh, when you see, when you have a deletion or insertion of a number of nucleotides that's not a uh, multiple of three, then uh, uh, you see, for instance, an example here where the C is um, deleted and uh, so you get an, an, um, a frame shift uh, of the, of your, uh, in, within your uh, protein sequence. And there are the nonsense uh, variants, the nonsense variants, uh, whereby, whereby only one nucleotide is changed and due to this, a stop codon is uh, introduced. And of course, there are also larger rearrangements that uh, may affect one exon or multiple exons, and that can also have uh, a pathogenic effect. How do we classify now uh, the variants? Well, in, when I started uh, my PhD um, more than 20 years ago, at that time, um, I was teached, I was taught that there were mutations and polymorphisms. However, this has uh, changed uh, over the time be uh, because that's, this terminology can be uh, confusing. Um, so to really establish if a, if a variant is a causal, uh, causal role for the disease or is pathogenic, there are several uh, parameters that can be taken into account. And since then, I, I think the first publication dates back from 2008 uh, from IRC, where they propose to use a five class system, whereby class four and class five are the variants that are pathogenic or likely pathogenic. So this may, may uh, respectively be consistent or confirming uh, the diagnosis. And these can be used to in the clinics to test at risk relatives for the variant or um, to provide full high risk and, and, and these patients or, or relatives that uh, have this variant should follow the full high risk surveillance uh, guidelines. Um, just want to, to show that um, the, the border the, of the, the risk um, uh, assessment has also changed a bit. So uh, in the first publication, it was more than 95% chance of being uh, pathogenic, while this was now in the, re in the more recent ACMG and ACGS guidelines reduced to more than 90% um, chance of being pathogenic. 
On the other end of the spectrum, we have the non-pathogenic uh, variants, so the not pathogenic uh, or the benign variants and the uh, likely benign variants. And then there is a large uh, gray zone in uh, between. Uh, it's the class three variants, um, which are of uncertain pathogenicity, and they do not confirm or exclude uh, the diagnosis. So these three last classes cannot be used for predictive testing in at-risk relatives. And um, if you want to uh, give advice to the patients uh, on surveillance, it should be based on um, family history and other uh, risk factors. So um, the, what the, the easiest variants to classify uh, are, the, uh, are the variants that are definitely uh, pathogenic. Um, and these are clearly all, all loss of function uh, variants, like truncating uh, variants, splicing variants, uh, large uh, rearrangement deletions, and missense variants in some um, specific functional uh, domains. However, for each rule, there are exceptions. And uh, the best known exceptions um, are, of course, in BRC1 and 2, because this must be the most studied uh, genes uh, worldwide, where we uh, on which uh, for which several uh, detailed um, um, well um, limitations are uh, being uh, published. Um, I will not go into detail about this because it's a bit beyond the scope of this uh, of this webinar. But um, the, the there is an uh, international consortium that has published uh, detailed guidelines specifically for BRC1 and 2. What about the unclassified variants, the class three variants? Well, um, the, what is the definition? Is a variation in a genetic sequence whose association with disease risk is uncertain, uncertain and a bit dependent on the country where you live. There might be different abbreviations used. So you can talk about UVs, FUS, or VUS, um, and variants of uncertain significance of variants of unknown significance. And of course, this is a, a large burden um, for the uh, people who have to report it in the labs, but also for the clinicians and the patients who receive these gray zone uh, results. And that's why it's important um, that we classify all the variants according to, um, well, uh, well, with guidelines, and that we use all similar guidelines to make sure that uh, when a, a patient is tested in lab A, uh, receives a similar interpretation as a patient with the same variant tested in a lab uh, B. And in 2015, ACMG has published uh, its first set of uh, guidelines, which are um, used uh, still uh, used a lot. And um, I think also for the participants to this webinar, uh, this, these are the most frequently used um, guidelines. In the meantime, several criteria have been further uh, refined. Um, from these ACMG guidelines. Um, so there are several papers to be found um, to give more details about some uh, parameters that uh, can be applied. Also in UK, they have, uh, uh, specifically for UK, they have developed own uh, uh, the guidelines. And um, although I'm not based in UK, I, I really like them because they really uh, are helpful to interpret some of the parameters, parameters that are a bit fake in the ACMG uh, guidelines. Um, also important to know as background is that um, I've been talking about the five class system to classify the variants. This is mainly used for the interpretation of the germline variants. In the somatic field, um, they often work only with uh, four cl clinical classes. So they make a distinction between the biological classes and the, the five biological classes versus the four clinical uh, classes, where, um, of course, the focus is not really to find variants associated with increased risk, but uh, variants that may uh, impact the, the therapy. And so they have variants of strong clinical significance, 
potential clinical significance, unknown clinical significance, and unbenign or likely benign parents. So they take together the two lowest uh, classes. Um, I, I am aware of specific uh, Belgian guidelines uh, related to that, uh, how to standardize this uh, for the labs offering uh, somatic uh, testing. Um, this is um, what I want to show for the Enigma uh, guidelines. They are only for uh, beer classification of parents in BRC1 and 2. The latest version already dates back from uh, 2017. And um, these uh, guidelines are specifically for the um, variants with a, a high uh, risk. In the meantime, the um, uh, Enigma consortium is uh, working together with um, people from ClinGen to establish uh, new guidelines uh, because here the Enigma did not use the, the same parameters as AC ACMG and they are now updating their guidelines to make them uh, uniform to other uh, generally accepted uh, guidelines. So maybe good to know that in the coming months uh, we, ex we are expecting the new version for BSC 1.2. So to, uh, coming back to the ACMG guidelines, uh, the publication uh, from 2015, there were proposed 28 uh, criteria which cover a variety of evidence. And they were mainly based on population data, functional data, segregation studies, de novo observations, um, allelic data, uh, so see, looking if there are a pathogenic variant on another allele that may help you to interpret the variant you identified, and also the use of computational predictions. Um, also, it, uh, it's, it's very important to be cautious that you do not use the same piece of information uh, twice. So, for instance, if you uh, evaluate uh, splicing, uh, if you have RNA data available, then you should maybe not combine it with uh, in silico uh, predictions. Um, and there are then several uh, criteria that can be used as evidence for pathogenic pathogenicity and um, criteria for benignicity. Um, you have, uh, it's subdivided in criteria which are very strong, strong, moderate, and supporting. In the, for the benign variants, you don't have the moderate uh, level. So here you have an, an, a bit of an overview uh, on, on some data, uh, well, well, the strength of some of the criteria for in, and, and the variation you can have. So for instance, for the population data, you can have benign standing uh, alone. This is used for variants that are occurring very frequently in population databases. So, uh, and with very frequent, I, we mean generally more than 1%, uh, then we can use it as a standalone um, criterion to determine that this variant is, um, is benign, uh, is benign, yeah. You also have uh, variants that are, uh, yeah, where you feel that they are too frequent to, to meet something, and then you can distinguish between BS1 and BS2. And variants that are very rare, for instance, can have a strong or a moderate, uh, can fulfill the criteria for strong or uh, moderate. And so there are different um, criteria for the different uh, parameters that can be uh, evaluated. So, um, and then if you take all the criteria together, uh, based on that, you can determine if a, if a variant is pathogenic or likely pathogenic or on the other side of the spectrum, benign or uh, likely benign. So for instance, if for to be pathogenic, you can have one very strong argument and one, very, one strong or one moderate or more than uh, two or more uh, supporting um, uh, uh, evidence criteria. And um, so that's uh, what is summarized uh, here. I still do not know this by heart. I still have a table on my desk, a uh, printed table on my desk to quickly lo look this up uh, to, to be able uh, to use it. 
Um, the disadvantage of this kind of criteria if, is if there, if there is insufficient uh, evidence to reach, uh, to reach a conclusion, of, uh, especially if there is conflicting evidence, then you always will end in a variant of uncertain significance. And this means in practice that you might end up with a lot of variants of uncertain uh, significance. And this is also, uh, can also uh, be uh, attributed to the fact that these criteria were um, formulated with um, rare diseases in uh, mind, rare diseases with rare uh, phenotypes. Of course, this is not the case for the variants we are studying in the HRR genes because they lead to breast or ovarian cancer or prostate or pancreatic cancer, which are also uh, like, well, quite frequent in a general uh, population. Uh, we can also not uh, use de novo status for uh, many of these genes, um, and also um, these uh, the criteria were also not formulated to take into account reduced penetrance or non-penetrance in, for instance, male uh, relatives. So that makes it sometimes difficult to do uh, reliable interpretations. And um, yeah, also we do often do not have large families available for uh, segregation analysis. So these are a bit the, the disadvantage, the limitations of the ACMG uh, criteria and why we cannot come to um, final uh, conclusions. And this is one of the issues that the uh, Cancer Variant Interpretation Group from UK, Canvic, has tried to, um, to solve. And that's why they have uh, published um, specific guidelines for cancer susceptibility uh, genes. Um, and I think the first version was published last year in 2022, which can be used in conjunction with the ACGS uh, guidelines. And um, it gives you more um, support uh, to, um, to know when you can use a piece of evidence as very strong, strong, moderate, or uh, supporting. So I'm happy to handle over the work to Trudy. Uh, she will explain in more detail the, um, uh, the CANVIC uh, guidelines. Okay, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, so as Kathleen um, mentioned, the ACMG guidelines um, don't uh, apply in all aspects to the cancer susceptibility genes due to the common phenotype um, and um, variable penetrance associated with those genes. So the CANVIG group was established in 2017 um, to work with the ACGS guidelines and within the ACMG framework to develop guidelines to help um, laboratories in a practical way to apply um, evidence criteria for the cancer susceptibility genes. Um, and as Kathleen stated, the first guidelines were released in 2020. And associated with this is a really helpful website that's open to all that um, allows um, access to uh, various resources um, where there are really good presentations explaining the use of some of the um, evidence criteria. Um, there are um, functional studies scoring whereby um, functional studies are assessed via the Vernick criteria um, and then the evidence, the information is, is put there so that you can go in there and see which functional studies are um, validated for use and at what um, strength they can be used. There's also um, the variant uh, database, the Canva UK variant database. Um, it's a data sharing um, initiative that was um, started by um, the it, within this forum, whereby I mean currently most of the information there is for BRCA1 and 2, but the Lynch syndrome genes are um, also increasing in, in number. Currently, there's um, nearly 30,000 entries in this database, and it's really helpful for looking at case control analysis and use of PS4, um, and it allows the use of PS4 at different strengths. So it's kind of, it's live. So if people have more information on a variant, they can deposit it on the database for everybody to see. So that's really helpful. Uh, so next slide, please. So last year, sorry, this year actually, just after run six, these guidelines were updated. Um, and so some of the, um, the changes include the introduction of this point system here, which is a move towards a more kind of Bayesian quantification system for assessing evidence strength. 
Um, and I think there's more information coming out on, on more on updated guidelines in 2022 from the um, ACGS and um, CANBIG. So, um, and indeed, specifically for BRCA1 and 2 in the updates for this year, the likelihood ratio scores from multifactorial analysis studies can now be incorporated in a more appropriate way, given um, how good this evidence is, for use with uh, PP5 and BP6, so that these can now be used at variable strengths, whereas previously this evidence couldn't really be incorporated. Um, so next slide, please. Some changes to the guidelines, some updates are further information for pathogenicity um, for the, the variants list, uh, for the cr criteria listed here and also for benignity. And they're grayed out in the publication so you can see additional information. And for example, you can see PVS1 from the 2020 guidelines, how much more information there is available for PVS1 in the updated 2021 guidelines. Another change includes the organizing of the evidence criteria into themes. So grouping them according to whether they address population data, computational data, functional data, and so on. And this helps um, also with thinking about what, what evidence criteria can be used together um, to be careful about double counting. So next slide, please. Further to this, there is information to help um, participants with um, ass assessing what, their, what evidence criteria can be used together by um, a graph of combinations towards pathogenicity and towards benignity. So for example, you can see on the pathogenicity one that PM1 can now um, cannot be used with um, PM5. So they are contraindicated by this red here. They can't be used together because it's considered as double counting and against the Bayesian um, dogma of only using what, a piece of evidence once. So next slide, please. Another um, bit of evidence that's been expanded is the functional data evidence. There's more information on this. There's a link to the functional studies that have been assessed by Bernick, um, and it brings you to this table where you can look down at the various functional studies and see that if you um, whether you can use it uh, for PS3 or BS3 at a strong or moderate level. You could. There's also um, advice or information guidance on what to do if functional studies are conflicting. By these two tables here, you can see if you have assay one and assay two, you can see whether, um, depending on the type of assay it is, whether you can't use the functional data at all, or whether you can, depending on the um, what the functional data gives you for assay one and assay two. So that's that's helpful as well. So next slide, please. So this scheme for RUN7 is a non-BRCA1 to HRR scheme, but we thought it would be useful um, to go through some of the variants in RUN6 because it does they do highlight some learning points that would be useful for the HRR um, RUN7 scheme. And also they highlight some um, points from the, um, some changes, implications of changes from the updating of the guidelines, uh, the CANVIC guidelines. So next slide, please. So starting with variant one, next slide. This variant is um, a splice site variant in BRCA1 where the prior risk of pathogenicity is unknown. Next slide. So it's um, there's information from the uh, multifactorial analysis um, studies indicating benign. It's uh, present in NOMAD um, 13 cases on the non-cancer females. Next slide, please. So there was um, no evidence favoring pathogenicity, but in favor in um, support of benign, there's BS3 strong because multiple splicing assays indicate no effect on splicing. And these are two studies that are indicated on the, um, the CANVIG uh, website as being validated for use at a strong level for both PS3 and BS3. So we can immediately assign BS3 to this variant. BP6 supporting was assigned based on the multifactorial analysis data that's out there reporting the variant as benign. Um, so based on these two bits of evidence, we get a likely benign for this variant. So next slide, please. So the returns for this, we're expecting a class two 
most participants uh, returned to class one, likely based on the multifactorial um, evidence that's there. Um, the, were, there were 13 cases on NOMAD, so some participants use PM2 and B, or BS1 for this. Um, PM2 would not be appropriate because um, it's only if you've got one or, or uh, zero cases on NOMAD that you can use PM2. The BS1, I'll just talk about that a little bit more in, in the following slide. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, BP4 and BS3 are contraindicated because they're counting the same bit of evidence based on slicing. Um, BS2 would not be so um, applied to the BRCA genes um, because of the penetrance and the fact that it's a common disease. Now, BP6 was the main reason of, for the difference between class one and two, um, and it's due to the use of BP6 at variable strengths by participants. Um, so at the time of the original, uh, at the time of RON6, the CAN Big Guidelines 2020 um, allowed BP6 only to be used at a supporting level, even if you had multifactorial um, evidence there. But now with the new guidelines, you can incorporate the, um, the likelihood ratio scores from these studies to be able to use BP6 at various levels. And using, using, it, um, using this likelihood um, uh, rate, uh, ratios allows BP6 to be used at a strong level now. So therefore you would have um, two strong bits of evidence and this variant would now be classed as a benign variant. So uh, next slide, please. Just talking about BS1 a little bit more, um, a lot of labs had used BS1 based on the fact that there were 13 cases in NOMAD. So for BRCA1 and 2, it's helpful to use this CardioDB tool. Um, and there's a good presentation on this in the CanGene website by Miranda Durkee. And using this tool, it tells you that the maximum tolerated um, allele count is 18 cases on NOMAD. So therefore, in this case, BS1 wouldn't apply. Now, you can't always use this um, CardioDB tool. Um, it's not really, it doesn't work very well if, if there are, um, if, the, if the gene has a much lower um, frequency prevalence in, in the disorder. So um, it, it's good for BRCA1 and 2. Um, so next slide, please. So classification of variant 2, next slide, please. Variant two is a missense variant um, where the prior risk of pathogenicity is unknown. Next slide, please. Um, and the evidence um, is as shown here. Um, so again, multifactorial analysis um, rates it as a VUS. Next slide, please. The evidence that we were, we were able to get together was a PM2 moderate, uh, PM1 supporting, um, PP3 supporting for a rebel score of 0.86 and PM5 supporting for this variant in the same position, same amino acid residue, which has been widely reported as pathogenic um, and supported by multiple um, functional studies that are in agreement for that variant. So we um, obtained a, a VUS a class three for this variant. Next slide, please. Participant returns. Um, agreed mostly with a class three, um, and there were some class four returns. So um, it, it, um, implications from the updating the guidelines um, since RON6 came out was that PM1 and PM5 cannot be used together. And in addition, in addition PM5, which is the evidence you assign for um, the similar variant being reported as pathogenic, this, this um, criteria can now not be used if your functional studies are conflicting. So therefore, with the change in the, um, the guidelines, you'd um, be able to use uh, PM1 now at moderate based on the enig Enigma um, assignment of this variant being um, a, a critical variant in the BRCT domain. So you'd have PM1 moderate, you'd have PM2 moderate, you would not have PM5, and uh, you would have PP3. In addition, using the um, likelihood uh, ratio scores for this variant from the Parsons paper, it would actually allow you to use BP6 at a strong level. So that's another bit of evidence you would have. It's a conflicting bit of evidence. So this variant would remain as a BUS based on conflicting pathogenicity and benignity evidence. Uh, next slide, please. So variant three, next slide, please. 
This variant is a frame shift variant, but the prior risk of pathogenicity is unknown because it's in the last exon of BRCA1. Next slide, please. So there's very little um, evidence that we could use from these resources. Next slide, please. The evidence that we did use was a PVS1 moderate and a PM2 moderate for not being on the NOMAD database. Um, so we get a class three. Next, next slide, please. The um, expected outcome was a class three, but most laboratories, sorry, most participants returned um, either class four or class five in fairly equal distribution. Um, PM4, PP3 and PP1 were all used by various individuals, um, but they would not be applicable in this case because the variant is a frame shift. The biggest difference, um, the biggest reason for class four and class five was the use of PV PVS1 with different strengths, ranging from um, strong and very strong. So next slide, please. So looking at PVS1 in a bit more detail, uh, there's a lot of information on the new guidelines for use of PVS1, and it's all around the use of the um, Abu Tayun uh, PVS1 tree. Um, so if we follow this tree for this variant, the variant is in the last exon um, of BRCA1, so therefore nonsense mediated decay is not predicted. And to help with this, uh, the decipher site is really helpful because it highlights the, the area of um, where NMD is not predicted in, in the gene. Um, there is not um, um, a stop codon created within the three prime UTR region of this gene. So therefore um, non-stop mediated decay is also not predicted. Um, and so we expect full length, um, well, intact protein with an additional 58 amino acids on the end and disrupted uh, last 10 amino acids of the gene. So just going through the tree there, the variant is a frame shift. It's not predicted to undergo a nonsense mediated decay. So now we need to assess the role of the region in the protein. What's the function? So one way to do this is to look at amino acids in the same region and also downstream. And we can do this by looking at um, a validated um, functional assay like the Findlay assay. Um, and using this, we can see that uh, amino acid um, missense variants variant at the position and also downstream do not um, alter the function, are not predicted to alter the function of the protein from the wild type. So therefore we have to um, assume that the role of the protein is um, unknown. The variant is just uh, behind, just beyond the region, the critical BRCT re region. Um, loss of function variants in the exon are not frequent in the general population and this exon is present in biological, biologically relevant transcripts. The variant removes or disrupts um, less than 10% of the protein. It's just the last 10 amino acids of the BRCA1 protein, BRCA1 protein that are disrupted. So therefore we um, get a PVS1 or moderate for this variant. Um, so that's just an overview of uh, three of the BRCA variants from RUN6, just highlighting some of the changes um, from the updating of the guidelines and just may be helpful for um, the, some of the HRR uh, genes in RUN7. And now I'd like to hand you over to Andrew. Thank you, Trudy. I am going to go over some of some examples from the HRR genes from RUN5. These are non-BRCA related. I apologize. Not sure why the slide. Oh, here we go. So variant four. Uh, this is a RAD51C variant. It's a missense variant that changes a leucine to a phenylalanine at amino acid 138. It's a missense variant and it's in the ATP binding domain of the protein. So in ClinVar, five labs classified this as either likely pathogenic or pathogenic. Uh, in LOVD, it's expected to, predicted to affects uh, function. One allele was found in the NOMAD database. 
It had a Revel score of 0 0.592, and SIFT and Polyfen predict it to be uh, deleterious. This is an example of a variant where we actually do have segregation information. There are two large pedigrees published uh, looking at this variant. So we were able to use um, PP1, so evidence for segregation on this variant. I know often is the case you can't find this type of information, but for this particular variant, it was present. Uh, there are also several functional assays. Um, they cited three here, but I think there were five last time I checked, uh, showing in various different assays that um, the, the function of the protein was disrupted. So for this variant, uh, we can use PS4 moderate, um, as this is prevalent in affected individuals so significantly more than in the general population, the controls. Also PS3 moderate, the in vitro and in vivo functional studies support damaging. Uh, we can also use, use PP1 as for the segregation data based on the two large pedigrees. I apologize, there's a typo here. This shouldn't be very strong. I believe it's meant to be moderate. Uh, there's also PP3, the in silico evidence supporting deleterious and PM2 as there is only one allele in the NOMAD database. Um, there was one piece of evidence favoring benign, and that would be P BP1, a missense variant in a gene for which uh, primarily truncating variants are known to cause disease. So when you add this up, you get a prediction class of class four or likely pathogenic. So the majority of people who submitted this variant got the expected class, class four. However, there was also a large population that uh, arised, uh, got to class five. And this was primarily based on using PS1 and PP2. So that those two pieces of evidence seem to be the two key pieces of evidence that separated classifying this variant as class four, which is what we predicted uh, versus class five. So the second variant I'm going to go over, which is the fifth variant, is a PALB2 variant. It's C.2506 G to A, which changes a valine at amino acid 836 to an isoleucine. And this affects the uh, RAD51 binding domain. So this variant is present in ClinVar, but it's conflicting in the evidence towards uh, whether it's a VUS or likely benign. LOVD has it as a VUS. There are three alleles in the NOMAD database, and this has a REVEL score of 0 0.02, and it is tolerated in CIF polyfin and aligned GVGD. Uh, there are no publications, or at least at the time of, of the scheme, there were no publications on this variant, and there are no published functional assays for this variant. So this is a case of one of these variants where there's very little information. You can use PM2 in that there are very few alleles in the NOMAD database. And you can use BP1 because this is a missense variant in a gene where primarily truncating variants cause disease. And BP4 based on the computational or in silico evidence, which, are, which you get to class three a variant of uncertain significance. This is a common finding for variants where there's very little information. You just don't have enough information to classify the variant in one direction or another, and they end up quite often being variants of uncertain significance or class three. And the majority of individuals who submitted this variant also classified this variant as class three. So the last variant I'm going to go over with you is uh, the ATM C.1898 plus 2 T to G. Uh, this is one of the canonical, it's present in one of the canonical splice sites. Um, ClinVar has seven 
classifications. Seven Labs classifying this as likely pathogenic or pathogenic. LOVD classifies this as affecting function. There is only one allele present in the NOMAD database. And in silico, splice predictions predict that a splice donor site is abolished. So using the PVS1 decision tree, we're able to use this information as uh, PVS1 very strong. It's also, we can use PM2 in that it is uh, at low frequency in the NOMAD database. In silico supports deleterious and PS4 is used as mod uh, moderate evidence as the prevalence of the variants in infected individuals is significantly increased compared to the controls. So PVS1 very strong, PM2 moderate, PP3 and PM4 give you a class five or pathogenic prediction. And once again, the majority of individuals classified this as being pathogenic with a small number also classifying it as likely pathogenic. And so that's the end of the examples. Thank you, Andrea. I'll pass over to me now then. So just to clarify um, that we have the will open the GTAP variant classification exercise for the external quality assessment, which is now run seven. Can you believe we've done six previous runs? It's fantastic. Um, so next slide, please. So the instructions to register for participation, if you've not already done so, um, is this website here. And we will put this information on both GenQA um, website and EMQN, so you know where to get that info detail from. And once your registration has been confirmed, you'll receive instructions on how to log in. Uh, the EQA will be open from today to the 26th of November. Um, and to participate, you just go to the genqa.org website and log into GTAC, there's a button there that takes you straight through um, and you can complete your variant classifications and hopefully um, the educational and the presentations that you've just heard will help you tremendously to tailor your um, evidence-based um, classifications. So you submit details of the criteria that you've applied for these specific variants. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can download your own report of your submissions. So when you join the second webinar um, in December, you'll have um, a note of what you have submitted and you can make comparisons there and then. So we do invite you to join the webinar on the 8th of December and we'll have an expert review of our actual run seven variants then and give you an opportunity to ask um, questions in the live Q&A session. So you just log into your GTAC account to download your assessed report and participation certificate and the EQA summary report after the second webinar. So next slide, please. So just remains to say um, thank you very much indeed. Simon, do you want to take a couple of questions? I see we do have quite a few in the chat. Maybe we can do some um, just guidelines ones before we end and we can add all of the feedback into the EQA summary report later on. Yep, um, thank you, Sandy. So I'm just triaging through the uh, through the questions uh, just, just to find a, a, something that uh, we, can, we can deal with in this, in this feedback session. Um, I think we probably could use, we could probably just um, get some feedback from the uh, panelists on the first uh, question, which uh, comes on the use of AC, uh, ACGS best practice guidelines. Um, so I think probably Trudy might be the best person to answer this. Um, so I use ACGS best practice guidelines for variant classification, the 2019 um, and the 2020 versions, and by combining criteria of ACGS uh, but the combining but the combining criteria of ACG ACMG should I say of 2015 is it wrong to do this should we be using the combined criteria of 2020 Trudy are you able to just give a quick summary again of using the combinations of the different uh, guidance for, for respect yeah to I, th this I think I think um, they're probably referring to the updated table in the ACGS 2020 guidelines. Um, so in that case, they were modified based on the um, Taptigian um, 
Bayesian paper in 2018, where there was found to be um, some um, discrepancies in the, um, in the grading, the evidence strength. So it's the table in the 2020 uh, guidelines that should be referred to for the pathogenicity um, combinations break. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it does. And so, um, as I said before, when we started this, the uh, the feedbacks, well, the, the webinar, we will, as I say, get back to the participants with a more in-depth in um, response to all of these questions. Yeah, I think there is a good ex explanation in the ACGS 2020 guidelines ahead of that table to explain the difference. Yeah. Sandy, would you like to pick another question? Yeah, I'm just looking down. A lot of them are about the specific variants yeah, that we've been talking here. Um, although there does seem to be a trend about the use of um, PS4. Four, yep. Yeah, so more sort of generic, and we will come back to you with specific question feedback, but where do you get the data to support the use of PS4 and which guidelines help in determining the strength of PS4? Any initial thoughts from, from the panel? And I suppose for BRCA1 and 2, it's, it's um, fairly easy if, if you use the, uh, you know, the Canvig website and the, the data from the UK labs to use PS4. But if the variant hasn't been reported there, the other source is to look at the literature and see um, what cases have been reported there, sort of specific literature reports of, of cases, but looking at the phenotype um, you know, carefully make sure that you it, it's a true case. Um, and then I think then you can use the um, the ACMG guidelines um, so that there's uh, by case counting, sort of there's two or more cases, you can use PS4 at a moderate level. Thank you, Trudy. So, so moving on from that, someone else has asked about advice how to use PS4 um, with ClinVar and publication case counts. So for example, the variants listed four times as a VUS in ClinVar, and no case in Nomad, can I use PS4? We wouldn't generally use PS4 in, in those circumstances because you can't dig down and evaluate the data and determine the phenotype that's behind those cases. Great, yeah, thank you. So that hopefully that's helped to clarify. There are some other specific queries on PS4, but I, as I say, we'll come back to those specifically. Yeah, looking at the question, Sandy, I mean, a, a lot of them are very specific to the particular variants we've talked about in the, already in the in the webinar itself yeah. so i think i did i value. did yeah i was going to say sorry to interrupt i did notice one question there's probably very quickly answered is the um the use of ps3 with pp3 it's one that comes up quite a lot um because in the um in 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 my variants there we couldn't use um the uh, B, bp4 with bs3 for the splicing but there's a difference um, in using the splicing in silico with the splicing functional compared to using the protein based in silico with the protein based functional. So those you can use um, the PP3 with with PS3 and BS3, but you can't use BP4 with B, uh, sorry, BS3 and PS3. Right. So, and I think we'll put that. That's very complicated, isn't it? So, I think yeah. we'll put that in writing. But basically, it's, it's about yeah. avoiding double use of the same evidence, isn't it? For the splicing, but the the protein-based function is okay. Yeah, it's separate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Trudy. Okay, I think we'll finish there, Simon. I think that's a huge yep. amount of interesting information. I know my head's spinning, so um, I look forward to to the EQA and uh, the next webinar. Yes, a big thank you, every, obviously, to you, the participants as well, for dialing in. Um, it's great to have so many people dialed in again today, so over 200 again. Um, we really look forward to you joining us in the in the actual EQA exercise itself, and as Sandy said, to our next webinar, which is uh, in early December, um, where we really do hope to have um, um, a really good uh, Q&A, live Q&A session for you. Um, on the on the results of the of the EQA itself. So I think it just remains for me to say thank you very much to everybody else involved, including the production team as well and the guys at AstraZeneca. Uh, and lastly but not least, my co-chair and most most importantly, um, the speakers from today. So a big thank you to them particularly um, for presenting such a great uh, webinar. And we look forward to catching up with you again early in December. <laughs>